our next speaker. Our next speaker is going to talk to us about taking care of yourself before you take care of others. And never give up. Our next speaker is a Parkland area parent and volunteer and a proud veteran of our armed forces. Please help me welcome to the stage Ms. Shelby Weekly. I wish I could get some of that cheese today. Um, I grew up with a family who was very supportive of any and everything we do. We didn't have much, but everybody always bonded together to make sure that nobody knew was out. So that carried with me through school, through high school, even when I became a teen parent in high school. At first I was embarrassed and ashamed because my family taught me better. But now I had to go, you know, I waited and waited. I was like, you know, about seven months. I hid it from them before I told them. Because I was, you know, feeling that they taught me better. But I still went and did, you know, the opposite of what I was taught. But when I did tell them, it was the opposite reaction that I thought. I thought I was going to get a bad dream. Because you always hear from your grandparents, oh, you're too young, you're having a kid out of wedlock, and they think you're supposed to get married, and you're like, what? So, but um, as a teen mom, my focus became taking care of me, and my motivation was my family. So, in, instead of me, I was inspiring, studying, smart, kid in school, athlete, and I wanted to be a lawyer. But once I had a kid, my choices changed, so I had to change my path. I had to choose a different path. So I chose the military. So at a young age, when I graduated high school, I joined the military. And it was more than, it was, I was excited, ready. I was thinking, this new adventure, I'm about to be a soldier, the first of my family, so it was a big deal. So I joined the military with big expectations. And my main focus was I'm going to provide and do better for my family. I didn't want my family to grow. I didn't want my kids to grow up like I did before and depending on my family. So this is my choice, the path that I chose. So I joined the military. Basic training was a breeze. AIT was a breeze. Jury Stars was yelling. To me, it was laughing because I was like, my mom yells. No. <laughs> Them yelling at me was nothing. It was like I got in trouble for laughing and making jokes. And they were like, what's wrong? private, beat your face, and to me, I was like, okay, I didn't know that we had to do push-ups, so, you know, I made fun of the drill stars, so I started to beat my face, and that got me into more trouble. So, at first, I wasn't a model soldier, you know, you get around other people from all walks of life, and you have other influences, so you start to fall in crowd, and you do things, you know, what you're not supposed to do, but then, you know, you get wiser, and you learn, and then they teach you about honor, respect, self-service, you know. Soldiers Creed, they teach you about discipline, mentally and physically tough is what you have to do. So you go through all this mental breakdown and mental brain up. So, you know, they train you to be tough, train and condition you to war the testing skills at all times. But what they don't prepare you for is the hidden things that you encounter while you're there. As a young soldier and as a leader, I experienced um, a lot of racism, sexism. As a woman, being in a, back when I came in, back in 1996, you know, it was a man's army, so I faced a lot of sexism, inequality, sexual harassment, and all of those things. And back then, the army didn't have, they had a program for it, for those things, but they wasn't utilizing it the way they were supposed to be. 
So most of you had to figure out how to deal with those things and how to make it through with no help. So I came from a family of fighters, so you know, I fought my way through. I educated myself on all the experiences that I went through, and I started advocating and helping others going through the same thing, because we didn't really have anybody to go, go to. So I focused, I put my focus on helping myself, I put it into helping others. That's how I cope with all of my things. And then comes the big thing on the leader now. And we're getting ready to go to war for the first time. Scared, real scared, because you train and everybody's excited. We're not excited, we're scared at the same time. You train and we're like, oh, we're going to do this and that if the enemy comes. But when the enemy came, the opposite of what you trained to do. <laughs> it's like, it just got real. So you go through a bonding. These sisters and brothers and all become your family away from home. You bond that you are who you have to lean on when you're out there. So you have that continuity and that support right there. And you go through the crying moments, the stressful moments. And then we all come back and then we go through things that depression, anxiety, stressful moments. And then for me as a leader, I'm taking on my own PTSD, my own stress, my own depression. And then I have 20 to 30 plus soldiers where I have to take on theirs as well. So for me, I have to suck mine up and hide it and help them overcome and get their things that they're going through. But in the meantime, I'm still hurting, but I'm coping because I see I'm helping myself by helping them. And that's what I did for a long, long time. I kept putting it off, putting it off, go seek help. But back then with us leaders, you seek help is showing a sign of weakness. But in all true, it's not a sign of weakness. Because you're weak if you don't go seek help. Because all I was doing was building up anger. And I was just being more depressed. And it was weighing on me. It was weighing on my family. It was weighing on how I was doing it at work and everything. So, you know, my husband would tell me, hey. My kids would tell me, hey. They know it's in me. So with me, I'm just focused on I'm a leader. I got to take care of my soldiers. That was my priority. But I was leaving myself to taken care of until the point to the point to where I was getting angry and I was snapping and I'm like, hey, what's going on with you? I was to the point to where somebody would make me angry. You know, when you go to behavior help, they ask, are you suicidal, homicidal? I didn't want to tell them. Sometimes I did want to be homicidal, not homicidal, but I was thinking of ways to really hurt people when they really made me angry. And I was like, hey, that is not good. You know, something is wrong when you're plotting to hurt somebody over just a steam argument. And that's how bad it had got for me. And I was like, where do you need help? So I started going to the heavy help, talking about it, talking with my husband about it, you know, just getting everything off my chest, changing the things that I did to better help myself so I can be a functional leader to help everybody else around me, so I can be a better parent, so I can be a better leader or wife, because it affected my family. But I didn't see that. All I was seeing is that I gotta help everybody else and not take care of me. And then my breakdown really came when the biggest challenge I faced as a parent, when my son was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, he was diagnosed with retinoblastoma, which is a type of eye cancer. That really hit me and my family hard because now I'm the helper, I'm the supporter, I'm the motivator, I'm the one that's inspiring, but it was nothing I could do. And as a parent, when your child is going through something, you just want to help. You want to make it, take it away, you want to take the pain away, you want to do whatever you had to do. But in this situation, there was nothing I could do but support him. But through it all, he inspired and supported me because through everything he went through, through the 10 procedures, the three critical surgeries, the chemo, the radiation, he still every day woke up with a smile on his face and playing that PlayStation Madden. And you know, he turned his negative into a positive. Yes, he asked me, why is this happening to me? But you know, we talked about it, prayed about it, and had the doctors talk to him through all his situation and everything. We didn't leave him out. We let him be a part of his process to know and be educated on his disability and stuff. So my take was 
that every day, if I can be, if he can be that strong and go through all of those things, then I can be even stronger to help and push myself to get help. Because he's a kid, he was my kid, and I was supposed to protect him, but from this I couldn't. And then today I always tell him every morning that he's my hero, and I tell him to make sure he puts on his Benjamin button, I call it the lotion, because you know it keeps his skin nice and looking, and he's keeping looking young, so I'll be like, hey, you put on your Benjamin button this morning, we have our jokes, but he has inspired me so much, because he has been so resilient through this, and he's coming up on his second year of a mission as being cancer free, and then, thank you. driving back to playing sports, football that he loved, basketball that he loved, all of this, and he only has sight in one eye. Even though the doctors told him they don't recommend that he do all this, but he's a fighter, and this is the stuff that he loved to do, so he wasn't going to let anything or anyone stop him from doing it. So my take from him was that if you can be this strong and push through and think of, make the negative out of a positive, so can I. And tonight, that is my big, my speech to you is, when there's somebody out there need help, help yourself while you're helping them. Because you're no good to anyone when you need help yourself when you're down and out. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel, and then just stay positive. We all come across people that's in our lives who inspire us, who encourage us, who are our biggest supporters. And then we just got to make sure we stay healthy and in the fight so we can give them the same and support that. Thank you all for joining me.